It is almost now time for our presentation. This evening's speaker is a nav native Michigander, that's actually a real thing, Michigander, and a self-professed car guy turned avid birder by the COVID lockdowns. He and his wife, Cheryl, were drawn to Ithaca during the pandemic, she by an advanced degree at Cornell and he by the allure of the Lab of O, Sapsucker Woods, and the Finger Lakes. Since then, he's engaged not only in his own local birding interests, but he's also helped out at the lab by being a past Kids Discovered the Trail group leader and recently been a beginner bird walk assistant walk leader. Tonight, we'll hear about his December photo safari to Kenya, where he had the opportunity to add a solo birding expedition and spot almost 300 species on his trip. He'll be sharing some incredible images of creatures both feathered and furred. Please join me in a warm welcome for Cliff. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, for those I haven't met, great to meet you. Uh, I'll just say uh, I'm an extremely novice birder, so if I say anything crazy or you guys, uh, if I miss something, feel free to jump right in and, and let me know. Uh, I'm not shy. But uh, again, this is about my trip to, to uh, Kenya uh, last fall. A great trip. Uh, started out for the trip. Uh, this was the uh, first trip uh, I took since the start of COVID. There was an annual kind of deluxe safari that goes to, to Kenya every year uh, with a travel agent that we work with. And uh, we decided to join in. This was their first time hosting this trip. And the screen again. sharing has problems. I, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm second technical trouble. So this was uh, their first time hosting the trip, so uh, we were lucky to be able to join in. Uh, actually got the last spot available on that. But uh, for this, this trip, uh, was their main focus was the big five large animal safari. Uh, I really wanted to do that, but I also, uh, since I'm now uh, very interested in birding, thought if I'm going all the way to Kenya, they generally see about 1,150 species in Kenya during the migration at that time of year. So it makes sense to throw in a little bit of, of birding uh, just for me. And I was able to find somebody who specializes in bird tours and he gave me a really great price on basically a private tour just for me uh, for three days before I went to the main, main safari. So really lucky. Uh, I'll share with you guys some of what I saw, but I saw so many birds, it's, it's impossible to talk about it in one night. You can see for this trip, I went all over basically uh, the western side of Kenya. Started in Nairobi, and for my three-day tour, we went within driving range from Nairobi and went to some really big uh, preserves and, and, and wildlife refuges there. And then he dropped me off back in Nairobi to join the main safari. Uh, and again, we went to all the biggest preserves all over uh, Kenya. Uh, nine stops total, and uh, we made some bonus stops with my private tour in between. So really, uh, if I counted everything, probably 13 areas that we reviewed on this trip. I have to get back into my presentation here. There we go. Uh, started in Nairobi. Nairobi, of course, being the capital of Kenya, is it is the most populous city in Kenya, about 10% of the population at 5 million people. What I didn't expect when I got there was the altitude is 5,800 feet in a lot of places. So I was learning how to breathe again. Uh, so it was good that I had a couple extra days to get prepared for the rest of my trip. Uh, my guide took me to the National, the National Natural History Museum in Nairobi. Great museum, a lot of great stuff. But uh, one of the coolest things they had there was stuff, uh, preserved specimens of almost a thousand of the 1150 birds that generally come there. So he was able to show me what I see, tell me what I see with him, tell me what to look for when I joined the rest of the safari, and uh, you know, live, in color, full version samples of everything to look for. So I had sort of a head start. He told me I'd be an expert when I joined the rest of the, of the tour, and I did feel like I knew a lot by the time we started going out. For this tour, uh, you saw the map where we went all over the country. Kenya uh, straddles the Rift Valley, so the lowlands in Kenya are about 2,000 feet altitude, went up to 9,000 going over some of the mountains. Almost 9,800, I think, was the, the highest recorded on my little 
sport watch here. But uh, all kinds of terrains, lakes, mountains, deserts, uh, rivers, we saw it all, and I got to experience some of the wildlife in each one of them. This microphone really hates me. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, uh, had an opportunity with my, with my private tour to do a little bit up close and personal uh, touring of, of Kenya, uh, something that I wasn't really allowed to do on the main safari. Abercrombie and Kent didn't want to take people into the, into the city and get exposed. They had a lot of concerns about risk of robbery, theft, pickpockets, all that. With my private guy, uh, he was more than happy to show me the city, which I really wanted to do. I had an extra day to acclimate uh, to the temperature, lack of oxygen. Uh, and without my camera, which he had me put away, I was lucky to be able to fit right in. So we went right into downtown. I went shopping with him for car parts. We went to the, the honey lady who sells honey on the street. So it was a really great experience that uh, I was able to get that I definitely wouldn't have been able to get on a big tour. Then, of course, on the big tour, we did all the tourist stuff. Got to go to some schools and see the children uh, doing their schoolwork. Uh, Maasai Village, where they did their Abubu uh, Maasai Warrior Jumping Dance, which was really neat, and some of their local village crafts. So all in all, a great look at the culture in Kenya. And then we got to the wildlife. Uh, very diverse, as I already mentioned. I saw some of the same animals at multiple different altitudes in multiple different environments. Uh, some egrets that I saw in the middle of the desert, also in wetlands. So uh, very, very, not just species diversity, but uh, habitat diversity where those species were located. So all that's just a long way of saying, uh, you saw the circuitous route of my trip, this story doesn't lend itself to a linear progression, so you guys are gonna have to bear with me. Follow me on my trip uh, at my whim. So we'll talk about a lot. Of course, the main reason people go to Africa and bulk is for wildlife, big five, the large mammals. So we'll cover that just so we'll say that we saw it. But big five, of course, lion being king of the jungle, the black rhino, uh, which is separate from the white rhino, is, which is not on the big five. Uh, black rhino primarily because it's more aggressive. If it sees you, it will attack you. Fortunately, black rhinos don't see very well. <laughs> Cape buffalo, which most of us in this room know as the water buffalo. The African elephant. And the leopard rounds out the big five. Not the cheetah. Uh, a lot of people think the cheetah is one of the big cats. It is a big cat, uh, but they're kind of slight of build, not very strong. Cheetahs get bullied a lot, so not considered a big five. Uh, which leads to the question, anybody know why they call it the big five? Not because they're big, not because they're popular, but actually it's a sad story why they're called the big five. Because British travelers, uh, colonialists, and safari hunters looked for the animals that were hardest to find and kill. The big five were the trophy five that British colonialists wanted to put on their wall. But we're here to talk about birds. And to start this, I want to introduce you guys to what became the favorite of, of the people in our teams. Uh, when we started our main safari, we separated into land cruisers that held about six people each. And, and generally stuck with the same group. And my group really fell in love with the lilac breasted roller, uh, which we called the Lola, uh, because uh, our driver was from the Central Rift Valley in Kenya. And uh, when we got back to our, our base camp and the other drivers heard us talking, what's this Lola? How do we find that thing? It's a great looking bird. And uh, they said, oh, people from that area in the lowlands have a problem with R and L when they say English. So uh, yeah, he means roller, not Lola. <laughs> so really funny, and we thought, oh yeah, great. So we teased him about that the rest of the trip. 
And uh, so for the, every time we stopped, the first thing we'd do is look for what our drivers started calling the lilac rusted roller. <laughs> but again, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of, of Kenya is, is arid desert. Uh, so most of the safari searching goes on around water or along the pathways to water because that's where the animals are gonna congregate. And so uh, we did a lot of, of waterfall and shorebirds uh, searching. So I'll go through a few of what we saw, but again, uh, many I won't be able to cover. One of, one of my favorites was the African jacana. Uh, you can see from his, his feet, uh, the thing I like about this, this bird is because it, it represents one of the funniest quotes that I've seen in eBird, where they, they say that it can easily walk on aquatic plants thanks to its ludicrously long toes. <laughs> so, love that quote. I think I'm gonna put that on a t-shirt. The uh, Egyptian goose is, is comparable to what we have here in Canada, in, in Canada geese here. Uh, everybody hates them, they're everywhere. Uh, the Egyptian goose is very, very wide-ranging, except in Egypt. <laughs> they only range into a tiny little corner of southeast Egypt. Don't know how they got their name. Uh, I'd call it the Kenya goose if I was going to name it, because that's where most of them are. And then uh, in the bottom right corner, you can see the blacksmith lapwing, uh, which is a good example of what I started calling tuxedo birds here. Uh, a lot of black and white birds throughout Kenya, and uh, I saw them everywhere. If you look, uh, they all look like they're dressed up for a party. These are a lot of the, the waterfowl that look very much like what we see in, in the US, uh, but all different species. African sacred ibis was pretty wide ranging. Looks a lot like what our white ibis, Hadada ibis was in almost every tree you pass. Uh, you know, Stephanie was asking about the glossy earlier. Uh, African spoonbills, of course, we have spoonbills. The lesser, uh, <coughs> lesser flamingo is very plentiful at the time that we were there. Uh, they normally go to a lake called Lake Nakuru, which was uh, one of the biggest lakes and one of the biggest national parks in Africa. <coughs> They left there because of the last year was a drought year. The water levels were really low. They feed on um, high salinity algae. Uh, because the lake was low, the birds couldn't go there. My guy knew a nearby lake, probably 30 miles away, Lake, lake Baringo, where we went and almost had all these, these uh, flamingos to ourselves. So probably 100,000 of these lesser flamingos. Is the smallest flamingo in the world at about 30 inches tall. And uh, yeah, they were hanging out. Of course, some other uh, greater flamingos there, which are the 42 inch tall variety, but uh, lots of those. Of course, the striated heron looks just like the green heron we see here. Uh, it's a similar family. They used to be considered subspecies partners, but uh, they've se since been separated. Tall birds. The gray-crowned crane is just a beautiful bird to see. I got to see some of these, you know, two feet away. They had some that were resident at one of the camps. I think I took some pictures like three inches away from their faces with my iPhone while I was waiting on my breakfast to get made one day. Beautiful bird with a beautiful crest. The marabou stork uh, in Kenya, they call it the undertaker bird. For obvious reasons. You can see it's got that, uh, that black cape, the white neck feather ruffle that we saw in the cartoons in the old days. That decayed looking skin that just makes it the most unattractive bird you see anywhere. Uh, they do function as a cleanup animal. They, they inhabit uh, dumps, eating all the trash. They clean up uh, carrion from, from unfinished kills. So. It, it's uh, biologically similar to all the storks, but functionally I'd, I'd almost say it was more of a vulture than a stork. This woolly-necked stork, uh, Asia, 
completely vagrant. Uh, it was a one-off specimen that hung out in, in a river uh, near one of our camps. Stayed there the entire time we were there for three days. It stayed there the entire time. Never interacted with any of the other birds there. Uh, normally not seen in that part of Kenya. Kingfishers. Lots of kingfisher species. Of course, the biggest being the giant kingfisher. Uh, got to look at this fellow right up close. Actually, it was in a battle with, with these two pied kingfishers that you see on the right side. Uh, they were fighting for the same tree. Giant kingfisher standing at 18 inches tall, these little 12 inch tall pied kingfishers trying to double team it, and they lost. This, this is them leaving the fight. Uh, the one on the top, the Malachite kingfisher, is what I consider the smallest kingfisher in Africa. It's just under four inches tall. You can see a beautiful, beautiful little bird. Uh, it was camped out on a, a log right behind one of my, my uh, tent. We call it a tent, but I call it a, geez, a lodge. <laughs> I had a patio on the back that I sat at and, and watched this little guy fish for minnows uh, just diving into the water. I made a video of that that I won't be able to share today because of time, but you can see it's a beautiful bird to watch. Um, there is another kingfisher, actually two in Africa, that are smaller than this. The pygmy and dwarf kingfishers stand at three inches tall. But I don't consider those true kingfishers because they don't like to get their feet wet. They live in forests and eat bugs, not fish. <laughs> And one of the fun things that I got to see uh, shorebirds doing was uh, the great white pelicans doing their cooperative feeding. So these guys would corral all the fish in the marsh. They're just walking and herding everything together. And then they take a dip and, and have a bite and do it all again. What was really neat about these guys was watching almost the, the herd like in unison direction changes that they, okay guys, you guys have left and we're gonna cut them off. <laughs> and really fun to watch. You can see those long tailed cormorants in the back wised up and said, hey, this is a good way to get an easy meal. I don't need to go diving. So very cool. The other part here, we got our hummingbird lovers here. Uh, I know my wife Cheryl was excited to hear the red throats are back in town. Uh, sunbirds are the African equivalent of hummingbirds. And all those same fabulous colors that we come to, to love uh, with sunbirds. Uh, you can see uh, just the variety was limitless. What I had fun with was, was again, Altitude changes uh, drove the biggest differences in the subspecies, but some of the things that you have to look out for, things as simple as the iridescence uh, determined what the species was. Like on the left side here, the scarlet chested on top glows green and blue, while the hunter sunbird below glows green and purple and doesn't have a green under chin. And so you need the right light to know what you're looking at. Uh, all the sunbird females, are typical like a lot of females, not a lot of color. Uh, the scarlet chested was one of the darker ones. Primarily, they were uh, generally tended toward buff and yellow with some striping. But that scarlet was very similar to the amethyst sunbird male. That was a dark brownish bird with a indigo violet under chin iridescence. And again, uh, you have to just really look closely to recognize that you're seeing five, 10 species rather than three or four. Getting out onto the savanna, there are a few things uh, that we saw. I wanna point out again, thanks to my, my private tour, uh, I was able to see some things that were really special that you know, a big tour company wouldn't take the opportunity to, to take you to. We made a special stop to see on um, just a vague hope uh, a very special bird. And the, the sharp's long claw inhabits just a tiny little sliver of Kenyan territory. 
only place in the world it's seen is maybe on five hilltops in Kenya, only between five and 6,000 feet, and only certain months of the year. So we went there uh, on the hopes of seeing this. People travel, ornithologists from all over the world to try and study these things and make a trip and hope that they can find one. My driver knew where these guys hung out. We went there, waded through swampy wetland for an hour, got our feet wet, but we did uh, get to see this beautiful bird. Uh, and you can see it's very well camouflaged. Uh, Joseph got sick of me trying to even find the bird. He snatched my camera away and said, here's a picture, darn it, let's go. <laughs> so uh, Joseph took this picture of the long claw, but, but again, really nice looking bird. Uh, something else that in, was in that same field was this long-tailed widow bird. Uh, we were there at the height of its breeding season, so he's got this beautiful 42-inch long tail uh, dragging behind him uh, that we got to see. Uh, fortunately, I had some technical problems with, with uh, saving pictures. I didn't get to keep the other uh, pictures from this. I lost them. Uh, so you can see what this bird normally looks, looks like, but it's shorter tail, uh, almost like a, I'd say it looked more like a, a red-winged blackbird. Uh, the juveniles looked like a juvenile red-winged blackbird, brown and, and black. And then a couple months a year, they get this beautiful long tail. And uh, this is, we'll see if you can hear the sound on this, but very windy day. Uh, you can see I'm getting blown around as much as this bird as he's flying backwards with his long tail. Really interesting bird, and this is how they attract their mates, uh, just doing these little jump flights throughout the field until somebody notices. Big birds. Can't talk big birds without starting with an ostrich, of course. Uh, standing six to nine feet tall, uh, the common ostrich is the biggest of the big birds. And uh, you can see here, again, something I learned on this trip, two versions of the ostrich, easily identifiable, not overlapping ranges. The common ostrich uh, normally has the pink legs for the male. Uh, during mating season, like here, they flush brighter pink. Uh, the females keep their, their dull brown feathers and gray skin uh, that people typically associate with ostriches. And then the Somali ostrich is blue. And uh, doesn't show up as well here on the screen, but bright blue leg and, and uh, neck skin uh, standing out. And I think they do flush a little bit pink during breeding season two. And then the females look very much like the, the uh, common ostrich, but the savannas are slightly smaller uh, than the common ostriches. The Cory Bustard, another big, beautiful bird, stands about four four to five feet tall, uh, roams the plains out there. Uh, we were really lucky. We, we did, before dinner, uh, an evening drive at most of our camps. And so right at dusk, we get to see the quarries uh, go out and, you know, they have a, an interesting mating pattern. They do uh, polygamous mating. So the males would go out every evening and puff themselves up, show off their feathers, show off their stuff mate with as many females as they can that night, then they go their way. The females will, will lay and tend the nests and raise the children with no interaction from the male. So uh, kind of a party life for the male quarries. Oh, and, and I did mention, I think before that, you know, we saw the lilac breasted roller on this trip. Beautiful bird, uh, lovely color. We tried to capture uh, that experience every time we saw it. It's not a large bird, but it was big in our hearts. And then uh, a bird that a lot of people go to look for, the secretary bird. Uh, it actually sits in its own genus, Sagittariidae, which of course is Archer because the, the people naming it back in the 1800s uh, thought it carried itself on the field like an archer out on a hunt. It has a very pronounced, slow, determined pace to the way it walks. Uh, but there's a lot of local folklore that fits it just as well uh, throughout Kenya where they say, you know, it's a secretary bird because it looked like when the British first colonized Kenya, you know, all the home offices had a secretary and they were 
hoop skirts, big dress, high heels, pencils stuck in their hair, and they had a very dignified way that they walk around. So everybody uh, calls these secretary birds because they look like a secretary. Uh, this bird is interesting because with those big claws, those high heels, it feeds by stomping its food and it eats small rodents and insects. And uh, again, another video I'll, I'll, I'll try and post. Uh, I got a video of one of these actually killing and capturing a mouse that it could eat. Raptors, talking about things that eat things. Lots of raptors, I, I couldn't name them. I didn't even see a fraction of the, the eagles and bustards and, and other things uh, that they have here, buzzards. Uh, but just a few, African fish eagle is of course the famous popular uh, African eagle. Uh, people love it because it looks just like a bald eagle. So again, tuxedo bird, bald eagle with a, with a dress bib on. Uh, so I uh, saw a lot of those. Uh, Tawny's gas, gas hawks. The auger buzzard is another one that I saw quite a bit of. In fact, this picture was taken on that hilltop where we saw the, the long tailed widow bird. Uh, all the other birds ended up with crests on this page just by happenstance. Uh, but that brown snake eatable on the bottom left actually is not a crested bird, it's just wind blown. Uh, I couldn't find any pictures of showing his face without his wind, uh, making his hair stand up. But it's actually a smooth headed uh, eagle. Uh, the Marshall Eagle on the other end is a crested eagle and it's the, the biggest in Africa. Uh, standing with a wingspan of about seven feet, slightly bigger than a bald eagle. Uh, and then of course, for some reason, you know, I got a real affinity towards that long crested eagle, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Then the little tiny pygmy falcon uh, was another one that I saw quite a bit. Uh, this pearl spotted owlet in the, in the center there uh, really offered me a lucky opportunity uh, when I was there because just when I checked into one of my tents at camp, I hadn't even put my bags down when this little guy perched in a tree 10 feet from my door, right at eye level. And of course, pygmy owls draw a huge mob of antagonists. So it parked there. I got to see 10 lifers before I even put down my suitcase. So really, really neat experience. I went and grabbed my neighbors. I said, guys, come and look, come and look. They were like, hey, birds, get away from us. But a great experience. Going out though, uh, again, Lots of other birds on the savanna. This represents my blue series for the starlings. Uh, of course, there are dozens of starlings in Africa. The most common bird I saw anywhere on all these trips was the superb starling. Uh, it was the bird. I think we've all had this experience on a, on a, a birding trip where I said, wow, that's a spectacular looking bird. It's actually superb. Let me get a picture. And of course, my guys, forget that. You'll see a million of them. Look at this one over here. The, the Hildebrandt starling, very similar, uh, was one of those. He said, take a picture of that one. You won't see that again. These are some of the birds. Uh, again, we did our night drives. These are some of the birds that come out at dusk. And uh, of course, the helmeted guinea fowl, uh, they say is the most commonly photographed bird on a Kenyan trip because you know, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, it doesn't show well on, on this picture, but in addition to that little racetrack pattern of, of polka dots, they've got a finely woven, like a quilted blanket uh, pattern stitched throughout their throughout their bodies. Uh, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm upset that it didn't show in the picture. And then the vulturine guinea fowl, extremely reclusive bird. We got to see it, you know, actually just crossing a field behind a, a bunch of guinea fowl, of, of helmeted guinea fowls, right at dusk. They only come out at night, so very rarely seen. I got this two seconds to take this picture. I'm glad I took the shot because we never saw them again. And you can see it's a, it's a gorgeous, vivid looking bird. Lots of woodpeckers as well. Uh, again, 
just like here, there's the red headed, the red belly, the red throated, all, all reds. Uh, here, there's a lot of grays. Uh, you can't tell them apart unless you, again, have the right light. You know, the African gray woodpecker uh, versus the mountain gray woodpecker, almost identical except the pattern dotting on their back feathers. Uh, some are vertical lines and some are horizontal bars. And that's the only difference, uh, of course. Uh, and the mountain gray has a red belly watch. So it's like, hey, Bert, will you stand up so I can see your stomach and get a better look at that? Then I, I don't know if I mentioned, but there is this uh, lilac breasted roller that we, we really grew to like on this trip. And so we, uh, we looked at a few of those. Hornbills, uh, 12 species of hornbills uh, range through Kenya. Uh, seven of those are black and white hornbills. So I got to see five of them uh, on my, my travels. Uh, the most common is the Northern red-billed hornbill uh, that's in the top center. But uh, you can see even, even for the black and white, feather dotting pattern and beak color are the main ways that we can distinguish between these. Um, you can see it uh, in the bottom left, the, the Bonder Deccan's hornbill. It was mating season. I saw a lot of horny hornbills uh, while I was there. This one is doing a mating dance. Uh, I've got some, some other videos of, of hornbills competing for the attention of females. And uh, they do this dance and they bang their, their beaks on whatever branch they're on and then leave and get closer. And, and sometimes there's a competition where they're leapfrogging each other to try and get the female's attention. But that Vonderdecken female, really striking appearance with her all black. Uh, I thought that was probably the best looking hornbill I saw, just really formal and sticking with my tuxedo bird thing. Uh, she fit right in. Talking about symbionts, uh, lots of birds that worked in parallel uh, with other animals. Uh, those guinea fowl uh, got followed around uh, by red-billed buffalo weavers. The guinea fowl dig for their dinner. So they go out at dusk and, and really uh, just crazily, rabbitly digging. They're very good diggers, but they're looking for big bugs and grubs and all that. The buffalo weavers say, hey, there's a hole. I'm sure it's got some mites in it, some small stuff. So they just follow behind those guys and don't do any digging and do all their feeding behind the guinea fowl at night. The ox peckers, you know, uh, we're familiar with work on the backs of, of mammals and 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 uh, other other animals to just feed on the parasites that are on the back of the animal. Uh, what I like here, we've got the yellow build up top that work in groups. So you'll see like in this case, one giraffe mob with a dozen of these little oxpeckers. Uh, the red-billed oxpeckers on the bottom tend to work more in solo, but I love the red bills because they have that little fleshy waddle around their eye. It always looks like a surprised cartoon bird. So I don't have any pictures without the red bill looking like, hey, what's happening? But a really neat looking bird. Then cattle egrets like we have here just hang out in the field and they follow behind the the cattle, uh, not on the water. So uh, this picture was the only time I saw cattle egrets actually near water. All the other times it was like, that's an egret in the field, what's going on? Uh, so looked them up and, and got this one opportunity to see them as a water waterfowl. Others, you know, tuxedo birds again, uh, the pied crow, uh, as common as a regular crow here, just way more stylish than the ones we have in America. The Abyssinian thrush and the African thrush, very similar, actually very similar to our robins, which we have here, of course, as a thrush. But uh, altitude differences, the Abyssinian thrush is dark, the African thrush is light, and really that's about the most significant difference between the two. As a military guy, you know, I can't help but love a, an animal called the purple grenadier. So uh, really liked, liked that bird, really vibrant colors. 
And then this gray headed bush shrike is one that we spent quite a bit of time trying to lure because uh, they're very social with each other, but they don't like human interaction. So uh, we spent probably 15 minutes with, with Joseph whistling to try to get this bird's attention because we could hear it and it would fly low over us, see who we were and then take off. Uh, finally, you know, he got a phone call and stopped whistling and the bird settled down. I took this picture from 500 yards away. Uh, that was as close as this bird would get to us, but really neat looking uh, when I got a look at it. Weavers. Weavers, weavers everywhere. I mean, boy, were they everywhere. Uh, and you can see uh, just the colors uh, were, were all spectacular. Uh, I didn't get any pictures of this one in the center, the white-headed buffalo weaver in flight, but it's got a brilliant red rump. They call it the tomato bird uh, because it looks like a just a bird flying, carrying a giant tomato uh, when it's flying. And you can see, uh, obviously, uh, the nesting that they do. There's some really neat looking uh, baseball shaped nests made out of grass. Uh, a lot of these hang out during near uh, rivers and, and ponds and build their nests out of reeds. And then the sparrow weaver just takes some stuff and lobs it over a branch and calls it home. Uh, what a common theme, they all uh, tended to inhabit uh, thorny acacia trees uh, that they used as protection against predators. So I'd say if there was one common thing about weavers, it would be the acacia. Probably the, one of the most striking birds that I saw on this trip, the, this top left corner, the African paradise flycatcher. Uh, really catches your eye. Uh, it's a small, probably slightly bigger than a sparrow sized bird, black with a brilliant blue ring around its eye and beak and an incredibly uh, bright orange tail and, and wings. If you look at the back of them, you see his wings were all orange as well as this long tail hanging down. So you see this spectacular black and orange thing flying uh, really rapidly and hard to spot in a tree. I, ch I chased this bird uh, one morning before breakfast for probably half an hour trying to get a picture because I really wanted to be able to see this bird again. Down in the bottom sort of center right, uh, the Eurasian hoopoe is another interesting uh, bird with that foldable crest fan, uh, big fan, zebra pattern on its back, a very interesting looking bird. They hang out on the ground and, and uh, forge around waterbeds. And then this Rosses turaco, and, and uh, I spotted that one sitting at a meal. Again, spectacular looking bird, bright yellow face, red crest, uh, blackish purple bird. But when it flies, the outside halves of its wings are the brightest red you'd ever see. So we're sitting at lunch and, and this bird flew overhead and I had to run and grab my camera and leave the meal because it was just an incredible bird to see. Of course, never saw it again. Got a picture from very far away and, and was really happy I, I captured it. I only saw two vultures, two types of vulture uh, while I was there, even though they have several. Uh, these guys hang out in really big groups, especially the white back vulture uh, hangs out in communities of a couple dozen in one tree or even around uh, one piece of carrion that they want to eat really sociable with each other. Uh, the hooded vulture, bright, vivid blue eyes, great to look at. Um, you can see that that sort of white striped head with a, with a black cap, really, I'd say it's, it's cute, bald, cute bird, definitely better looking than a miracle stork. There are three types of speckled male's bird. I was told I'd see all three because they're very common. Uh, these birds are, again, very fast moving birds despite their long tails. But uh, I got two of them, the speckled and the white headed mouse birds. And again, uh, attractive looking birds and uh, very plentiful. This white browed cuckoo, uh, really 
uh, one bird that I really enjoyed seeing. I saw it quite often. Uh, doesn't do it justice on this, but it's Rufus back. It's just spectacular to see under the, the sort of streaky black and white top feathers. Uh, in flight again, it looks very dazzling. And I'll, I'll mention this little Fisher's lovebird because uh, we, we saw this apparently newly wet couple moving in to set up a nest uh, in this tree hollow. The hollow is this little area right below. And uh, he stuck his head out and saw us waiting for them to come out and take a picture. And he said, not gonna do it. So <laughs> we waited for 15 minutes. He stared at us for 10 of them. He left, she never came out. We, we had to give up and leave. And we'll talk about rollers and bee eaters. Uh, again, for those who don't know the difference, this is a cheetah, as opposed to the leopard has the teardrop pattern on its face, uh, which makes it, you know, look like a sad cat, but it's a very beautiful animal. Yes, every picture in this presentation is mine. Maybe 20 feet. It's surprising on these safaris. Uh, you know, I, I've got some leopard leopard pictures where the leopard and the lions, in fact, walk right up to the, we were in land cruisers, walk right up to the, to the vehicle, walk around you. You know, they never look inside. They just think that the vehicles are an obstacle and really strict rules. Keep your head and arms inside the vehicle because once you break that silhouette and they see you as an animal, it, it changes the equation for you. But you can get very intimate visits with a lot of these uh, creatures uh, just because they're used to the vehicles being around. I might have mentioned this bird before, but yeah. <laughs> uh, lilac crested roller was, was definitely one of our, our most loved ones on this trip. You can see just spectacular in flight. These guys are, are beautiful to look at. I, I stuck the bee eaters with them because they had those vibrant colors too, just gorgeous, gorgeous animals uh, to see. Um, beautiful colors, long tails, vivid feathers. Uh, this tiny little Madagascar bee eater, again, a vagrant. They do range in Kenya, but the part of Kenya we were in, uh, we should have seen it. My driver driving down the road, 45 miles an hour, stops the car, says, hey, I gotta back up, I, I saw something. And he spotted this little four inch tall bird, 30 feet off the side of the road. You can see it's on a, on a uh, guideline for a, an electric cable. So the cable is, you know, a half inch and you can see how, how big the bird is compared to that. He spotted this little thing, you know, while riding down the road and he should have been watching the road, by the way. Uh, but I was just very impressed with the visual acuity of the, the drivers and the guides there. You know, at one point, I, I mean, Joseph was saying, hey, you see that son, that secretary bird down there? It looks like it's, it's mating. I said, I got my binoculars. I said, I can't see any bird anyway. So these guys do this stuff every day. They can spot it. They can see it. Uh, they're equipped to operate in the savannah. So uh, definitely worth going and having them show you around. Then uh, the white fronted bee eater was another common bird. If we talked about the, the frequency of, of sightings of all the different birds, definitely the superb starling I saw everywhere as, as often as we'd see a sparrow here. Uh, the lilac breasted roller, which I might have mentioned already, uh, was, was common there. I, that is probably the second most common bird I saw, fortunately, because we loved seeing it every time. And, and by the way, I created probably a dozen new birders on, in this trip out, out of our group of 30. Uh, people got so excited uh, when they started seeing what was right in front of them already uh, instead of focusing on the big animals. And then this one, white fronted beater, was probably number three in terms of, of ubiquity. And uh, nice bird to look at. Then I, I told you guys before about the lilac breasted roller that we saw. Uh, this is actually a European roller, uh, very similar. Uh, 
This is the only one of the rollers and bee eaters I saw that isn't endemic to, to Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, these guys migrate from Southwest Asia, Southeast Europe and come down and they go as far as the Southern tip of South Africa. So they migrate a huge long way just so they can hang out with their cousins, the lilacs. So uh, just ending it again, because of time, uh, this picture captures the essence of, of what my experience was in Kenya. Taking a picture of, of you know, what you think is an unusual bird you haven't seen before. In this case, those are uh, village indigo birds, all females and one juvenile. Thus, uh, no indigo there, but they turn, the males are black with a dark violet sheen, getting photobombed by something that's even cooler, right? <laughs> a red cheeked cordon bleu. So the whole trip, I mean, I couldn't catalog fast enough the birds that I was seeing uh, around. And this list just shows the stuff that I couldn't show you guys tonight, but you see, I saw 302 total species while I was there, 207 of those just on that focus three day uh, birding trip with my guide. Then the next two weeks, I saw another 95 with 213 lifers for me for this trip. So very good trip. I, I'm really happy I went. Can't wait to go back. There's still 900 that I haven't seen yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess any questions? Well, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for listening to me. I will say, uh, if you guys want to go to Africa, anybody going to Kenya, let me know. I'll join you. Uh, I'll hit you up with my friend Joseph, and uh, we can make a party out of it. So, thanks. Yes? Yeah. Are there any yeah. questions? Yeah. Overview of your gear and the temperatures for photographers who might be considering it. Uh, for for my trip, you know, and, and I don't know if if you guys have the. I guess the question was uh, uh, just a brief overview of the gear I took and uh, tips for people wanting to go to Africa on a birding trip. Most people uh, who go on a on a safari to Africa take you know. A, a camera, obviously a digital, just so you can take as many photos as you want. Uh, I say get as much resolution as you can. My my gear, I have a really top end camera, um, but uh, most people travel. If you look for recommendations on a lens, a 400 millimeter lens for birding is is great. Um, I had a 400 with a, an extender on it, so I was shooting at 800. Uh, there were some instances where I was wishing that I had access to the lens that I ordered for this trip, which was an 800 millimeter lens, uh, because there were some things that I, I couldn't reach, uh, especially when I was on the, the big game safari, because they didn't want to bother with getting me close enough to, to the birds to look at them. Um, there was actually one bird uh, that I could see off in the distance, but I didn't record it even though I'm sure it was because the biggest owl in Africa, elephant owl, uh, not too many things that look like that, but couldn't get the driver to go over there. Couldn't quite see it. If I had my big lens, I'd be able to show you guys a picture of it and say, hey, that's an elephant owl, but I didn't. Um, so 400 millimeter or bigger, if you're looking for birds. Uh, in terms of photography tips, um, you gotta be fast, birds move. Uh, I always uh, shoot at really high speed for birding. Um, if we talk shutter speeds, if you're, if you're controlling it yourself, 2,500 or faster, uh, 1 2,500th of a second shutter speed. Um, the, the guys that do this all the time shoot at 32, 44,000 uh, of a second. So, uh, but really you need something that'll focus fast, 
um, or get really practiced at focusing yourself and then shoot really high speed because when you get those telephoto lenses, uh, there's a lot of shake. Uh, birds, when they're flapping, uh, if you're not at least for stopping flapping, you need about two, one two thousandth of a second to freeze the wings. Uh, and then you have to compensate for you moving. Uh, if you're, you're gonna be on a, a safari trip with a driver, try and, and find some way to take a bean bag so that you can prop on the vehicle to eliminate shake. I, I had a really strict weight requirement because I took a lot of camera gear. My, my camera bag weighed more than my suitcase. I think I had a gym bag and a 35 pounds of, of camera gear. <laughs> and, and you know the, they had porters at all the camps and they said, oh, I'll take that for you. And really regret it. So I, I relieved a lot of the porters by taking my own camera bag. But those are the biggest, biggest things I'd say. Big lens fast speed, and then just practice before you go, because- Did you use a monopod in the vehicle? I, I didn't, uh, just because it's it's hard to manage. Um, some people do, if you're in a vehicle with, with just a couple people, like when I was driving with just my driver, I could have sat in the back and, and used a monopod. Uh, but when you've got people and you wanna move, again, birds take off and you need to go over here and go over there, and that monopod will, knock into things. Uh, for big animals, if you're going on a big animal safari, a monopod will help you. Uh, if you're going on a big animal safari, you know, the distance at which you need a big lens that would require a monopod, uh, you got so much uh, heat, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, heat, heat shimmer, uh, that you you don't want a big lens like that for for uh, looking at those animals anyway. So uh, yeah, I, I'd say a monopod is overkill uh, unless you're on, on foot. Yeah, monopod for sure. But uh, for covering covering big areas, I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you got a weight limit. You know, we had a weight limit of thirty five pounds that I had to negotiate by taking my camera gear on the, on the plane. Uh, with me just to avoid the weight limit. <laughs> Everybody marveled every night when I, they say, what did you do today? I averaged 2000 photos a day. I took a total of almost 20,000 pictures. But again, I'm loving uh, my camera. Out of that 20,000, I'd say, 10,000 of those were absolute keepers. I was throwing away pictures that people would kill to be able to take. Uh, what I ended up functionally keeping was about 4,500 pictures, which is, is quite a bit, uh, but every one of them is spectacular. Yeah. Uh, it this one, you know, we got a, a really great deal. Uh, my wife and I priced out a, a trip to, to Africa years ago, and, you know, they quote you a price of $1,000 per person per day uh, if you go on a, a, a luxury safari trip. Uh, this one, you know, they were trying to drum up the business from, from COVID, which is why I jumped on this. It was a 10-day a trip for $5,000. Uh, I jumped on it, and then... I expected to pay those kinds of prices when I negotiated with, with Joseph for my private trip, but Joseph gave me three days of just me for $2,400. It was actually five days, three days of bird watching, um, which was a great deal. And, and we spent 10 hours a day walking. We walked about between seven and 12 miles each of those three days. And Joseph knows uh, birds. There was nothing we saw that he couldn't identify like that, uh, including wildlife, you know. Uh, and that's that's what I told everybody about, you know, yeah, it's great to go on a wildlife safari and maybe you'll see some birds. But if you go on a birding safari, you're gonna see leopards, you're gonna see zebras, you're gonna see rhinos because you can't not see them, they're right there. But if you're slow down, and look for the birds, you're going to have a, a much better trip. And, you know, like I said, a, a dozen people from that group said, yeah, I'm going to do birding now. 
which was great because people really uh, loved uh, the experience of, of seeing our friend, the lilac. <laughs> Is there any particular reason why you chose a lilac colored shirt tonight? <laughs> oh, I didn't notice. <laughs> yes, lilac colored shirt in, in deference to our lilac breasted uh, roller and friends. <laughs> you got to follow? Yeah, no, I, I would add like uh, surprises that are improved their computer just assume the safari. I'm sorry, one more time. The prices had right. It included only the safari or the foundation also. No, the the prices were. Uh, yes, what the prices included for for those prices, they didn't include airfare, but everything else. Okay. Um, and again, uh, I'd say that A and K Abercrombie and Kent safari uh, pricing was on the high end, and. I've got to say it, you know, I, I couldn't fit it in, into this presentation for the for the, the time, but I mean, one of the lodges I stayed in had crystal chandeliers, marble countertop sinks. Uh, you don't need to do that. In fact, uh, the lodges I stayed with with Joseph were regular, you no know, Marriott level lodges, and uh, perfectly fine, especially because you're going to be out all day. Uh, out in the field looking at stuff. And when you get back to your room after a 10 mile hike, you don't care whether you got a crystal chandelier. <laughs> any other questions? Oh, right, Jane. Okay, is there any um, pressure on all these birds from human overpopulation in Kenya? I don't know anything about the population size compared to the room. Uh, yeah, question was about uh, interaction of humans versus the bird species in Kenya. Uh, one thing that I, I admired about Kenya, uh, like a, a lot of the uh, lesser developed countries, they've realized that their future lies in conservation and particularly ecotourism. So they've got a very active engagement. In fact, uh, I think in 2013, they passed a law uh, protecting a lot of their their wildlife species. That's when you, you hear a lot about, you know, they've got shoot on site authority for poachers of big game. Um, you don't have to argue with them. You don't have to determine if you think they're guilty. If you see somebody poaching, you can shoot them. Uh, so with that comes, you know, a lot of uh, protection for other species too. And uh, you know, that was, they, they have levels of, of, you know, we went to national parks, uh, we went to game reserves, and we went to conservancies. The difference is the elevated level of management and protection for each of those. Conservancy being where they're doing research and protection, and in some cases, uh, habitation for some of those species. Uh, we visited Old Pajeda uh, Wildlife Conservancy where they have some of the last remaining northern white rhinos. Uh, the last ever male northern white rhino lived there and died there a couple of years ago. Uh, so they've got a couple of females uh, that they're maintaining. At that same site we saw, uh, and, and we got the hug, a black rhino, uh, Baraka, uh, who was blind, would have died in the wild. Uh, but because they're a species of concern, they adopted this this animal gave it 100 acres of private space, free from predators, food competition, and everything. And Baraka is living, you know, a life that he wouldn't have had in the wild. So, uh, yes, there's growth, but they're protecting a huge swath of their land uh, to keep their economy rolling with people who are interested in preservation. Yes, sir. When you're on foot looking for birds, who's looking for the lions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have to be very careful. Uh, who's looking for the lions when you're looking for the birds? Uh, that's that's another uh, reason uh, to go with a reputable safari company that specializes in birding. Again, we talked about those levels of, of there's the parks, uh, reserves, and conservancies. 
National parks are the places that are generally safe to walk around in. Uh, reserves, you got to have somebody with you that knows what they're looking at. And, and on our tours, uh, not on the birding tour because we stuck to national parks. And then when we got to a, a reserve, I didn't get out of the vehicle. Like those waterfowl pictures, most of those were from inside a vehicle. Uh, but when we were even in the vehicles on the reserves and the conservancies, which are completely unmanaged, except they're keeping an eye on the species, uh, there were people in the, in the party that carried shotguns and rifles uh, for protection of, of the group. Uh, and we had some Maasai guys who had their bow and arrow, <laughs> uh, which the other guys laughed at, but, but they were there. But yeah, something to be careful of. Oh, Janie's been, been waiting. I wanted to ask about the secretary bird. Um, I always thought they run like 20 miles after snakes. And I was surprised to hear you say that they were eating small mammals. Yeah, they eat snakes as well. Uh, I, I, I didn't witness any of them running. Uh, they're certainly equipped for it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. That was about secretary birds, by the way. Uh, I know the focus is on um, birds and animals, and we talked about the percentage of uh, landscape, and any of that is desert. But uh, any generalized description of the plants and terrain and so forth there that you would encounter while you were taking all the pictures? Uh, a generalized description of the terrain in Kenya. If if anybody well, just what, yeah, if, if if anybody's been to Arizona, uh, scrub desert in Arizona, I'd say is a very good analog for for Kenya. Uh, big plains, uh, uh, and these big plains are again, you know, five thousand feet in the air. Uh, so we went over some hills, but when you get to the top of the hills. Uh, big flat plains, uh, and I'd say dominant uh, geologic environment is more of a scrub desert. Uh, populated pot, you know, with with lakes, but Ma Maasai uh, Mara, the the big preserve that everybody is aware of. Uh, Mara means spotted. It's the the spotted desert. Uh, that from the clouds and from the scrub uh, occupying the different areas there. But yeah, I'd, I'd say generally, it's it's like a walk in, in a cowboy movie in Arizona. <laughs> Temperatures ranged uh, at 2,300 feet, 95 degrees in December when I was there, uh, 7,000 feet, 60. Uh, so, Big difference. And, and when we were on the top of those mountains at nighttime, it'd get down to 40, 45. So, yeah, with my little gym bag, I had to be able to kind of do a lot of, lot of stuff. What insect did you see? Talking about all big things, yeah, not small things. Not a lot. I, I took the bug spray, I never used it. Um, so, I didn't, I didn't see any insects flying. Well, I'll take that back. If if I stayed out late at night, uh, I encountered no seums, uh, as probably the only insects I interacted with. You know, I, I walked through some swamps. I walked through grassy fields. I never saw any grasshoppers. Uh, at that altitude, you don't see a lot of mosquitoes, fortunately. Um, flies. In some of the fields, especially if there were cattle around, we, we saw biting flies and 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 uh, just regular harassing flies looking for food. But yeah, I didn't see a lot of insects. So these insectivorous uh, birds and animals are way way more agile at finding stuff than than we were. The insects were in hiding rather than in attack mode for sure. Anything else? All right, guys. Thanks again.